Доброго ранку всім. Раді. Good morning all. We are happy to greet you at the 7th Donbass Media Forum. And today we shall speak about new ethics and how it integrates into media content. My name is Lisa Kuzmenko and uh, I Разом Together we have with us Anastasia, who is a journalist at Gromadske Radio. She also coordinates Povaha and Alexandra Korchinska, a journalist at Novo Yevremia. Today we we'll also have with us Angrina Karyakina, general producer at Suspine. So hi everyone. Hello. So our conversation about uh, the new ethics, though the concept of new ethics, we are talking about new ethics, though the concept of new ethics is not new. This concept originated in Germany at the beginning of the 20th century, thanks to, to this uh, f women's uh, emancipation. There was uh, Helen Stecker who told some very revolutionary things that uh, love is most important and love shall be the uh, single legitimate uh, foundation of relationship between men and women. If we use this new ethics in the new format, we can speak of movement Me Too and have this moments influenced in the new ethics of the media content. I would like to start with that. When I think of what is new ethics in contemporary Ukrainian media, this is about using feminatives. If before Ukrainian media didn't want to set uh, to use these uh, feminatives, so they laughed at that, uh, they were laughing at uh, some of them. Now I see that more and more media start using uh, feminatives. It becomes a new norm. I would like to ask my colleagues what they think about new ethics what it is to you Liz, I would like to say that a lot of media are still <laughs> reluctant to use feminatives out of principle or probably they just don't uh, think about what they use uh, sometimes uh, they use feminatives uh, in one text and in another they don't for example last year people laughed uh, at a message when, for example, in Zaporizhia, a uh, police officer with uh, his husband, I mean, it, they uh, need to write with her husband, but they wrote with his husband and everyone laughed. Uh, so if you, so that we still have uh, these same sex marriages, it is allowed in Zaporizhia. So we already have reached equality for the media. So dear media if you don't want to be laughed at when your messages can be read ambiguously for example like in this case then you need to use feminatives so Hromatska radio at Pavaha do you use feminatives of course definitely does Novo Vreme use feminatives Angelina what about Suspirna we do use, we do do our best uh, to increase uh, feminatives, to make it a systemic approach. I would like to say that uh, there are some editors who use uh, feminatives all the time. However, there are others who just don't care and you need to show them that uh, there are several, uh, there is a lack of feminatives. That is why it is necessary to point it out to them. I wouldn't say that uh, we are perfect, however, we are doing our best to do that. We won't uh, call the names of those editors and journalists who do not use feminatives. However, do you think shall it be mentioned in the editorial policy of a broadcaster or shall it be just an ethical question? And the journalist uh, must uh, choose themselves whether to use feminatives or not. In big media organizations such as Suspilne, UAPBC, some practices are possible only when they are stipulated in the editorial policy. It does work. When it is uh, a top-down approach, it works. When you show a piece of paper to everyone uh, which was officially uh, approved, then it works if it's not a whim of an editor. However, there is a flip side to this coin. Let me tell you honestly, if this is not 
a conscious approach, conscious practice or tool language that most people use in the editorial office, then those uh, policies which are stipulated in a document, they are still not used by everyone. If uh, senior editors don't use these feminatives in daily life, if they, if we don't hear that in the editorial office, then they won't be mentioned in the articles. If we say that the media is a reflection of the society, can we say that the society is more willing to use feminatives and the media reflects that? Let me tell you this uh, way. With several speakers, we are discussing this issue. We have a number of experts that I, whom I really love. We've been working together in the area of human rights for many years. However, they uh, don't want to use feminatives and they ask them to not to use feminatives. Recently, we had a discussion with the press service of, of uh, an ambassador who didn't want us to use uh, the uh, word uh, female ambassador. And uh, she said they didn't want to say any feminatives at all. So it's often happens. It often happens on the one hand, but answering your question about the new ethics, it seems to me that feminatives there is a uh, visible or at least some part of this problem. It seems to me for audience and for media in the context of the new ethics, finally big uh, chunks of problems have become visible and they are now in our news bulletin, in our materials, not only domestic violence, not only sexual harassment. and and plus at some moment they have become um, visible for people who have never written about this or has never th have never thought about this um, what is uh, the, this terminology or and they didn't know that it had any link you know to patriarchy or feminism this was my next question yes we started with feminatives and uh, clearly that new ethics it's not only about feminatives i'm also inviting our listeners to ask us questions on Facebook and I have um, a tablet so I will read them all and I will g give these questions to our speakers and continuing the topic what if not feminatives what else goes into this new ethics well it's the correct terminology if we s if Angelina mentioned about the topic of uh, d uh, uh, of covering the topic of domestic violence, I would like to mention that it seems to me that uh, um, you know the uh, many journalists they perceive some terms which is always uh, mentioned in the press release, like when there is a victim, when there is a woman uh, or uh, abuser. But and it seems to me. Uh, taking some press release facts into our text, we are to remember how it is perceived by the person who's going to watch or read our product. Because when we write about a woman who suffered from domestic violence and call her a victim, then it will be that that's going to be the perception that domestic violence is something that cannot be overcome; that it just happened. So it's it's like a victim of terrorist act. So if the person has survived, then it's a survivor, not a victim. And it's not only that, it's just about the perception of the format of what happened. So writing and saying a victim, we stop perceiving the act of violence as something that can be handled. That something that it's just that it's something that happened. Well, continuing this topic about abuser. They call him like, and this way removing in the terminology the responsibility from him because if he has abused someone, it means, th but you can do something with the abuse. But obviously, the terminology, uh, you know, is not frozen. You just, you can't just come to the Department of Journalism, study some terminology, and use it all your life. As an example, I would like to say I have recently found out 
we are used to speaking about we are uh, used to saying that people with disabilities but it was something new to me it's better to say not a person who's using a wheelchair but a person who's using um, you know a wheel wheelchair wheel carriage or before we spoke about national minorities and that's what it says in our constitution but now it's more correct to say national communities maybe you also have uh, such uh, things uh, you know in the new terminology what has changed in the past few years it seems to me uh, everything has changed significantly because when i studied at the university my thesis was about journalistic ethics that's my for my bachelor's degree and i understand what i knew about journalistic ethics back then i understand young people you know everything that we can recall about us when we were 20 but nevertheless it was not uh, you know something we were used to speaking about ethics i was looking for a protagonist or heroes characters for my thesis and they just looked at me with their wides open saying what are you writing about so this is the profession but when we stop perceiving our profession uh, you know in that way and to go through also the consequences when when we don't think of, of it as just of a craft then we have another attitude to ethics okay speaking about the correct terminology I have uh, the same question for Angelina and Sasha. What was like a grand opening for you and ho why is it important for media? Um, a few years ago, I have visited an online training by one of them was by Deutsche Welle. It was uh, dedicated to the topic of migration and the new term that I found that there was the person with migration background and it's not only those people who have migra migrated but also their children they are seen as people with migration background and there were journalists from Deutsche Welle there who write in Russian as well so they use this term in Russian but I haven't man noticed that in our media I was surprised but I have uh, developed the guideline together with the Alliance of Public Health about the correct language and you can download it, it's free or you can order the printed copy of it, also free of charge I have collected many examples there how it is correct and how it is not it was about different segments, uh, spheres of life about people with disabilities and LGBT and uh, the sex workers and about people having addictions um, living with a drug addiction there you can uh, find some you know specifics and I also found some new things because and I had to consult with those people who are working in the sphere about certain nuances uh, you work for the Novaya Vreme. How is it important for you to use the correct terminology? Or does your editor correct your mistakes if he sees some incorrections? Well, before the guidelines appeared for my editorial office, I have prepared such a Google uh, table what is right and what is not right. So it's, you know, this local self regulation when the journalist himself wants. To uh, to change these editorial policies and they uh, go not from uh, the top down but they are go from the uh, lower level yes i try to do everything correctly but i face that the colleagues might not just know something but or not misunderstand something but it often refers to the editors who uh, are translating the materials or who are placing some new or publishing some news on the website and they might not know but okay right away Sasha there's a question for us uh, from our listeners about where you can download this um, methodological guideline please give the link and the same they say that it would be good to create like a vocabulary of correct terminology and such uh, vocabularies have already been you know created you just go you can just google correct terminology for media and i'm sure you will find a lot of interesting information 
uh, Angelina, are you here with us? Yes, of course. What do you think about the correct terminology? How important is it in the work of a journalist? And it's obvious it's not only about words, but about words having the meaning. Uh, a revolutionary for me, from the point of view of the new layer of sensitivity was one experience this year. But for my main work at Suspilna, I'm also the co-founder of the uh, lab of uh, social interest. And this year, our team together with uh, uh, Novaya Vreme have published the special uh, edition of journal where, where the Crimean team, having Crimean Atata editors, and how shall we get Crimea back was the title. It was the practice where about Crimea, the residents of Crimea were supposed to speak about it. We were supposed to give them the possibility to think about it. And the Crimeans were supposed, or Crimean people were supposed to de de decide the topics, the problematics. And uh, when the, uh, the running order and when the team was, uh, okay, and And the Crimean Tata, who was the cameraman, when she was thinking about such certain visual things, she said, let's do this in lavender color, because lavender is a symbol of Crimea for many Crimean Tatas. Uh, we told them a lot back then that it wouldn't have, it wouldn't occur to any of us, uh, you know, if we didn't uh, give this project or if we didn't uh, engage uh, the Crimeans and Crimean Tatas uh, to do this. Of course, in our team we had lots of editors who would have done this job very well. And we had this uh, journal and before this there was a film and there it was very important to involve people. So quite often the editorial offices uh, tell about problems, they tell about some phenomena in their own words, using their own terminology, looking for some words, but in the editorial office they either don't pay attention and there are no such people who could say, well, first of all, don't speak about us without us. And secondly, it would be more comfortable for us if you spoke about us in this way. These words are unpleasant for us or these words mean this and that. So this sensitivity of terminology and linguistic sensitivity is born from the real sensitivity, from the real inclusive, inclusive uh, um, you know, principles in the editorial office. And it seemed to me that you could use some rules, right? And say that that's what we have now and that's how we should do it now. If uh, you uh, take uh, pay attention who approves the final decision in the editorial office, a man or a woman, especially on such questions concerning terminology and topics, or how sensitive is this man or woman to these problems? or how many in our editorial office do we have people who represent different layers of society, different communities? Do we have people of other nationalities or, or other religion? Or maybe, you know, other people just with any different, with other specifics. It's a good practice for any manager of the editorial office because when the editorial office has diversity, and it's inclusive, it can be reflected both on the topics, on the language. Okay, so there was a small uh, interruption, but uh, yes, Angelina, I completely support what you say. When we speak about discriminated groups of people, we can use such a notion as nothing about us without us. Uh, that's what we always write about the Roma community experience. If we cover the rights and lives of LGBT, we, we are to speak with the representatives of the LGBT community. If there are no open uh, representatives, if it's a small uh, town, you can find the human rights organization, but you are to go to the first source. 
Anastasia, did you have also a comment? Yes, while Angelina was uh, talking, I was thinking about the experience that I had for the past two months. I don't remember exactly when it happened in the Romatska Radio uh, editorial office. I was just editing the story of our regional correspondent about a family where there's a child with, this, uh, with uh, um, the child with a disease. Um, and uh, this child uh, had the, the cerebral palsy and the doctor of the child decided to uh, give a comment uh, what led to this and this comment i don't remember uh, what exactly he said but if i didn't read and it was taken out of context i wouldn't understand what was the whole point you know you just read the story about the life of the family when uh, it's hard to go on the fifth floor with a fifth year five year old child with no elevator how they go to rehabilitation how the state is helping them to call a cab at state cost and so on so there are some like sensitive and uh, useful things but then the this story ends in a comment that a pregnant woman is to take care of herself and she is to think carefully of what she drinks, eats, does, and so on, and that's all. And I'm r I was reading this ending, and I realized that contextually we were led to the fact that this pregnant woman was guilty that she had a child with cerebral palsy. But it, it's no fact that that doctor did say this. Our journalists could have, you know, taken any quote from any part of her text. To share. I read it once again and I uh, become shocked how that could happen, how she could end this article with these words. You can Google it, you can read where cerebral palsy can originate from, and we cannot blame the woman that she did something wrong. Well, Nasty, you know, this is very typical to the media when, for example, mother leaves the child. Why we never speak of fathers who uh, love their children? Well, you know, the thing is that uh, later I suggested our journalist uh, to, um, to join a training on uh, this uh, terminology, but he said, no, I don't need this training, I know how to write. I'm not sure if that uh, uh, sh he reacted to the uh, same if a male editor would uh, suggest it, because I always feel these uh, gender stereotypes when you are treated like a girl who just wants to uh, teach uh, all the boys. Gender equality, this is the new part of the new ethics. When we are talking about gender parity, gender equality, that uh, the woman is not to blame. I would also like to say that this is an element of some kind of a general awareness and professionalism. If you understand that you know the topic well, or that you don't that you understand nothing in uh, cerebral palsy, that you don't have enough experience, probably you heard something from someone, you just Google it, ask people. But it seems to me that uh, this journalist uh, reached out to a journalist. Yes, he did, but he didn't have enough experience to use her commentary, which would better highlight this topic. Well, speaking of different cases, I uh, remember the so-called Kaharlik case when a woman was raped in a police department. It was interesting to get a look uh, how the Ukrainian media wrote about uh, this topic, covered this topic. It was something awful because all the uh, highlights were shifted. Uh, People wrote not because our police was working bad, but because the woman was uh, uh, not very good. A journalist uh, visited uh, the city mayor, the village mayor, and he asked whether this woman is a good mother, whether she cares for her child. Back then, the Commission for Journalist Ethics um, called on uh, the Ukrainian media to shift this focus from the uh, from uh, the victim of this uh, rape uh, to the perpetrator of the crime. Do you remember any uh, cases like that? I organized a training 
a lecture on gender responsive journalism, gender oriented journalism. I made a presentation on this topic. There were such cases as uh, the case of Oksana Makar. Uh, uh, this was uh, a young woman from Makolaev in 2012, if I'm not mistaken. An 18 year old woman was raped by three men. Then she was put on fire and left to die at a dump because they thought that she died already. But she didn't die. She was brought to a hospital where she was conscious for a couple of days. And it was a novel case that everyone wrote about. A year after that, in Mykolaiv Oblast, there was another case in Vradievka, when Irina Krushkova, who was going back from a um, club uh, late at night, and uh, a car stopped. She was forced into this car. She was beaten up, raped. You mean that the media wrote about it in a pejorative way, right? What unites all these stories is that in all those cases, the media wrote about what kind of woman was she. For example, uh, with the case uh, Irina Krushkova, who survived uh, uh, this rape, I even found in a Mikolaev local newspaper where a journalist just went around uh, the village where Irina or the town where this uh, woman uh, lived and she started asking uh, neighbors about Irina. There was a quote that Irina is a good woman, she's not a prostitute and it was said by local women who uh, were selling something on the market. But uh, what about the station t today? Do you, do, do you see uh, developments in, to the positive direction? Well, not. I cannot say that. We wrote about the case which happened this summer. If I'm not mistaken, it was in Krivirich when uh, a local dance teacher was uh, uh, accused of uh, raping uh, his underage uh, student. And we also analyzed how the media wrote about this case. And there were such awful things that I felt terrible because we are discussing this, we are discussing um, the new ethics. However, there are a lot of media outlets. Uh, very often these are original outlets uh, that don't um, choose the right words to write about those uh, vulnerable topics. They are writing about this story. Uh, they write that the this uh, dance teacher was uh, very handsome, was young, and uh, that is why all the girls were in love with him. So by saying that, they blame on the girl. Uh, they say that uh, she was to blame because she was in love with him. That is why he raped her. So you mean that the regional media are not well informed? They don't want enough to write the right things. I think uh, the problem uh, is both uh, lack of uh, knowledge and uh, lack of understanding that uh, this is a huge problem. It seems to me the media understands that this is a problem when they are told directly about that during different trainings or when people uh, face such challenges in their own life and they understand that victim blaming is a practice which can be sooner or later used against them in any situation. Angelina, what do you think? I would like to tell you a couple of things. I remember when I was starting as, as a journalist covering topics which are related to human rights. When we started uh, writing about New Key of Pride events, uh, where when there were more po law enforcement representatives, uh, police um, representatives than uh, the protesters themselves, and people asked me, why do you care about this topic? It's of no use to anyone. But finally, we really saw that uh, so many people can go out into the streets to protest for the human rights of the LGBT community. I received from participants of these events of Kyiv Prides a lot of complaints about how uh, my colleagues and myself used uh, uh, different words, the terminology. Okay, some people 
are confident enough, are confident that they know this topic to continue learning from their own mistakes, to make conclusions for the colleagues and to move forward. However, as for the others, they become scared that they don't know how to write about it, especially it happens in local media. So, Annalena, what would you recommend, for example, to a journalist who is afraid to cover this topic because he or she doesn't know how to write about that? Let me explain it. It's not only a recommendation to the media experts, but to all those topics who cover this uh, topic, to NGOs, to human rights organizations, or organizations that represent a particular community. We just need to explain to journalists. I would like to support you. If you are speaking of civil society organization or LGBT organization, there is uh, the term SOGI, sexual orientation and gender identity, and a lot of uh, human rights defenders that they use this abbreviation SOGI, 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 and um, uh, just general audience cannot understand what does it mean. That is why I would recommend to use simpler language. As for the journalist, if uh, I would recommend, if you don't know how to name a person, you should ask him or her. Exactly, I agree with you. Uh, the basis for improvement is dialogue. I know a lot of people in different regions uh, who uh, attended, uh, for example, an event and uh, wrote an article. They were criticized because they forgot to use a feminative or confused terminology. And taking into account that as a person came, made an effort to come attend this event and uh, to uh, write an article, to write this article, to cover this topic um, uh, in a small village, for example, where it's too difficult to work with this topic, then I would say that it's then it's better to to stay aside, to understand that uh, we all have the privilege to live in the capital of Ukraine, to have uh, uh, your network, to have enough education and to help those people to understand this topic better. Because if we help those journalists, they started writing more about it. They were no longer afraid how to cover this topic, because very often they cannot understand when a f how to write when a far-right organization attended uh, uh, dispersed uh, participants at, uh, for example, a um, protest event, they don't know how to write that because uh, they don't know how to, uh, they don't know even that uh, representatives of national communities have the right to organize uh, their meetings or uh, screenings. So the balance in journalism is not to invite far-right organizations or represent and representatives of the LGBT community or Roma community uh, on screen and uh, let them have a fight and to have a show. Yes, that's true. Uh, the conversation about human rights starts uh, about explaining where this right is uh, stipulated in uh, the constitution of Ukraine or in the legal framework of Ukraine. Anhelina, <laughs> it's like Hermione Granger, who knows everything. I don't want uh, you to think that uh, all we do is uh, putting the blame on regional media. No, that's not right. There are some awful situations uh, that happen not in regional media, but in uh, but in large TV screen or uh, TV channels. I wouldn't call the names. I don't want uh, to blame anyone. and. Second, I just don't remember the name of this TV channel. Uh, at Povaha website, we were preparing for interview with Ella Lubanova, a researcher, head of the Institute of Demographics and Social Research of Ukraine. When preparing to this interview, I watched a lot of interviews with her at different uh, online channels and TV channels, and of course, which topic is discussed with her. Demographics, uh, for example, uh, she was asked to discuss uh, the demographic situation in Ukraine. They asked Ella, what shall we do? This demographic situation is very difficult. And then they show maternity, uh, maternity hospitals and uh, they start saying that uh, why Ukrainian women uh, do not uh, bear a lot of children. So 
they were asking about demographics however uh, they put the blame only on women so first why putting the blame only on women do they just get pregnant themselves in a vacuum I fully support what you say, however, this TV channel thought that women were to blame, that to show this maternity uh, houses was good in this topic. You are right, not only original media, but big TV channels uh, make mistakes. Let me remind you that you can leave your uh, questions in the comment session. What can we do as journalists? not uh, to uh, show our privileges we can use the correct uh, terminology uh, we shall take into account gender parity in our articles or news stories we can react to situations when our colleagues make mistakes uh, use sexist language we have an anti award which is called Tse uh, Yaitse. It has been there for the past several years, organized by Women in Media, Detector Media, Ukrainian Health and Key Human Rights, Institute of Mass Information, Zmina Human Rights Center. They uh, nominate uh, people for this award for sexism in politics. And then they give them this symbolically such X. And last uh, uh, a year uh, from the party uh, of the several of the people, they got this reward. Also, the candidate for the position of the city had Irina Vrashuk and the now closed pro Russian channel Zik. The sexism was also noticed there. And I uh, encourage to also submit your nominees this uh, year. You can do it on the uh, websites of these organizations and uh, so that these candidates get their eggs. I just have a very emotional mimics. Uh, sorry, dear colleagues. Uh, so, and Lisa thinks that when uh, she speaks, I'm just sitting here and I'm just making faces. No. Angela, did you want to say something? Yes, I wanted to say something that uh, our journalism and journalism in general lacks, uh, you know, humanism as an approach when the human being is in the center of the uh, story. And often the journalists are working on the topics. Uh, they say that uh, of some idea, let's prepare analytical material, but they often forget that any idea and any topic starts with a irregular life of a human being and whatever the topic is about some i don't know difficulty of access to education in villages or access to health services in some communities which is the challenges of life of the elderly in ukraine when you go and speak to this person with your feet you know not when you don't communicate with experts or politicians but when you speak to this person that's when you have the contact with reality and if you give this person a voice and actually uh, that is the mission of the journalism uh, and the uh, you know journalism oriented on a person is to give voices to everyone whom we can't hear because of different reasons and that's when the sensitivity is born and if we take a look at what we read what we watch i lack a lot you know some reports uh, and uh, when you are trying to show to the uh, journalists you know uh, that you can do this and that when there is a live person in the center of the story and it's not that their story is told for them that's what i like a lot and that is a problem also that uh, we have no this reportage and that's what it is worth you know to do that's facing the character the main character 
I completely agree with you, Angelina, this sensitivity and new ethics, gender equality, it exists on two levels. First, it's in the editorial office. When we take a look, who is the decision maker? Is it a man or a woman? And that person is in our media content. You can't just uh, write the policies and trying to make the balanced contents uh, in compliance with the new ethics, but only have uh, men in the board of members, in the members of the board. We have announced that we shall speak also why new ethics can help the editorial offices on all levels, uh, you know, get trust of or gain trust of uh, the audience. Yes, yes, go ahead. I don't see Nastya's mimics, I'm just raising my hand. So if you don't mind, I can start. It seems to me that trust is born where people feel that they are not lied to and when the real things are discussed, where the real things are discussed. But no matter how the politicians are manipulating, saying that Me Too movement is imposed by the Western world, but uh, and that but flash mob in Ukraine ag appeared f earlier in Ukraine and uh, before the Harvey Weinstein story that we heard which still uh, 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 can be and uh, you know uh, completely realized the gender equality problems problems of uh, I mean gender inequality problem then uh, social inequality it is in ukraine in all the layers so not to tell about this that's already to construe some picture of distorted reality right and people can't correlate themselves with it so the trust is born where the real honest talk is what about what people really feel in their lives and if we take a look at the you know surveys social surveys depending upon the formulation of the question the majority of uh, the questioned in ukraine they believe that men and women have equal rights but when you ask them about some uh, roles in the marriage about load on men and women from the point of view of uh, care after children level of salaries that's i would be very careful with this public opinion they like to appeal to no 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 lisa when more questions are asked to people men also agree saying that because uh, recently it uh, uh, it was said that a woman cannot be the minister of defense because this was not going to be well perceived uh, you know, uh, uh, by the society. Uh, Nastya is wants to say something. Nastya is just very emotional. Sorry, I just wanted to say about the trust of the audience. With the tr trust of the audience, it's a difficult story, and you cannot always, uh, you know, see it as a hundred percent marker. Because I always ask m myself a question, which audience? So my example, I have a program on Hromatska radio that I do every Thursday. It's a Hromatska Khvila or Hromatska wave. And in the beginning of October, we spoke in the framework of Hromatska Khvila about social project. A survey on the uh, menstrual hygiene in schools and those lectures given by the public organization girls together with UN UNICEF they have developed the uh, lectures plan uh, it's also sex education and I get uh, the letter from uh, one of the listeners uh, in which she says that she couldn't wait until this program was over and that we are uh, you know, uh, we, and she was saying that we were, so what did this letter mean? Was it 
She said that we were just spoiling the audience when we speak about menstrual hygiene. So, but uh, everyone has, you know, to be taught so that the boys wouldn't, uh, you know, take these uh, pads uh, stuck to their hands and scare everyone with it. If we don't teach them, uh, what, you know, they will still do it. And uh, they will, these boys will turn uh, into men who, when by being in the supermarket and seeing the hygiene, the human hygiene uh, paths, that they are going to be scared of it. Uh, you know, there is a joke. If the women, women's purse is going to be, uh, you know, cramped with tampons that the guards not going to check it because they will be afraid to go through it indeed it is like that another thing i wanted to mention it's about uh, trust of the audience and what angelina mentioned the more you ask the more questions you ask people uh, the uh, more you can get you know some revealings and uh, we have discussed uh, this issue also that men don't see a problem in the violence and harassment until they have daughters and when they are asked do you want your daughter to be treated like this woman for example or like this they say no no not to my daughter of course i don't want her to be hurt so they start seeing more problems like this or they don't yeah, well, it depends. Of course, not all of them, but for somebody, it can be a, an urge to change their viewpoint. And concerning the editorial policy, I wanted to add, I have my, I hold this phone in my hand because I opened, we have the editorial policy that is published on the website and you can check it. I just opened it because we have a chapter denying any uh, any forms of discrimination and it says and the discrimination policy in the production of content and it says that uh, it, it, equal opportunities are given to the representatives of different ethnical groups uh, or religious groups and that we think it's uh, inappropriate to have discrim discriminating uh, comments or any other ones inappropriate publication of material aimed at the hate and uh, creating negative images of people on the basis of sex race and so on so most importantly is that this policy works and you now can go on our website and uh, if you have no such policy then and i wanted to say that we have two minutes left so very um make very short summaries you know previously they asked who do you think you're going to be in five years from now and this was asked at the interview so speaking about new ethics what is your short forecast what is it going to look like in a year or two you know i wanted to finish on an optimistic note because i have grounds for it i'm looking at younger journalists younger than me and some of them are very young they're not even 20 yet and these are people who are very sensitive to topics of inequality and gender inequality especially and uh, we can think that that's the trend that we have now and lot a lot of pop content mass content mass culture content and that's good that uh, that everybody likes it but i'm looking at the journalists i'm working with who are very young who are just studying at the university how well, their reaction to inequality uh, or you know some remarks they get then maybe me wouldn't feel you know as a remark like coming to work with a naked stomach or so you cannot tell these things to them we, when we were young we would uh, you know accept such comments or remarks but you can't criticize them anymore angelina we'll have one more minute okay so very brief 
things that we are talking here about in Ukraine are still not popular. And if us as media representatives working with it, we have to be prepared that uh, they will hate us on certain matters and they, they will get some remarks uh, to, I mean, editors, journalists, we have to be psychologically prepared to for such claims maybe, but, but it is a conscious movement. It's a conscious choice. So it's an inspiring summary. I also think that the journalism will look different in several years, but to our generation, our generation has an important mission on account of younger journalists. We have uh, to give them, you know, the backs. Uh, because the story of uh, Oksana Makarchin, those children who get internship in our editorial office, they don't know, but they are to know, to know which path our journalism has passed in a short term, how it has changed and which are the sensitive uh, accents, because it hasn't always been like this. Sasha, do you want to add? Yes, in brief, uh, my own observations, uh, I see changes in journalism and in journalists who cover such topics that more people uh, get interested in these things and that regional journalists become curious and I hope they will look, keep on looking for, uh, you know, places where they can get some new knowledge. And our task, I agree with Angelina, is to help and to give some a tip of advice. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you for this conversation. Let me remind you that it was a seventh media forum. My name is uh, Lisa Kuzmenko. I had with me Anastasia Bahalika, Helena Karekina, and Alexandra Ogorchinska. And now we have a short break. Thank you.